Good afternoon and welcome to the third installment of the Oliver and Adelaide Tumble Foundation's Unfinished Business of Liberation webinar series. The series um, has begun this year and so far we've tackled uh, the constitution and climate justice. We hope as the Tumble Foundation and our partners, which are APSA and the Zola Square African Social Policy Innovation out of UCT, we hope to examine the social and economic advances that were intended as the outcome of the struggle for democracy. How far have we come towards achieving universal access and true equality? Has ground been lost and how do we gain it back? What measures need to be put in place to realize optimal social and economic status for all? And how much of an impediment is incompetence, a lack of political will, corruption, and mal maladministration? In this series, in which I said we've already tackled the Constitution and its um, intentions, as well as cl climate justice, we explore the current state of socioeconomic affairs root causes of failure, and what measures need to be taken to self-correct. With this particular dialogue, as you all know, we are hoping to chat about the dispossession perpetuation, land reform in South Africa in 2021. Uh, land reform has been central to the liberation struggle, is central to issues happening right now. It's been central for hundreds of years. The removal of Africans from their land devastated communities and the sustained dispossession continues to adversely affect black South Africans especially. Um, this country, now we have section 25 of our constitution and the expropriation bill, but we still need to answer a number of questions including, where is landlessness felt most acutely? Is it people wanting farmland or people wanting land for housing? What do we spend most of our effort on? Is it land restitution or land redist redistribution? And what is the long-term spatial planning and development in determining overall land strategies? Does the expropriation bill help or hinder land restitution? And what are the continued effects of landlessness on the black population of this country? I don't wanna talk far too much because let's be honest, you're not here to hear me talk at all. So I'm gonna hand over to Bolelwa, who is the head, director and head of land reform and restitution and tenure at Worksman's and she will be our facilitator today. And she will be discussing this very important topic with Tembeka Mugaitobi, who is the, an advocate of the High Court of South Africa, an author and a political activist. Professor Ruth Hall, who is a Saatchi Chair and Professor at PLAS, based out of the University of the Western Cape. Nobukosi Nguenia, who is a Research Fellow at the African Center for Cities at UCT. I want to thank my partners today for what I know will be a wonderful discussion. And to my entire panel, thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us. And for all of you joining us, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screens. If you're joining us from Facebook or YouTube, please feel free to post questions on all of those platforms. Um, we will definitely get them through to the panel, as many as we can. We do only have an hour and a half. Um, and if you're posting on social media, please use the hashtag Tumble Webinar Series. Thank you all, Bulelwa, thank you so much for doing this and I hand over to you. Thank you very much, um, Natasha, and um, greetings to my fellow panelists, um, uh, people that I've had the, the, the blessing and the benefits of working closely with um, in different capacities. So I think the very first question that I'd like um, to pose to each of you, Ruth Tembeka and uh, Nobukosi is, we know that land reform is a constitutional imperative, um, but do we talk enough about why it is also important for nation building, for social cohesion, and for the national psyche um, of building a country where all of us can feel a part of? So 
perhaps just to use that as a broad um, uh, point of uh, departure to say land reform, why, you know, beyond its legal uh, place and constitutional place in our society. I think I'll start with Ruth and then I'll hear from Tembeka and then uh, Nobukosi. Sorry, I didn't say who I'm posing the question to. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Bulalwa, and thank you to the Tambo Foundation. It's really lovely to be here with you all. Um, so I actually, it's interesting that you raised the question of, of why is it about nation building? What, what, what is this for? Is it only about poverty reduction? And actually, I think that this sort of goes to the heart of the issue, that there are different arguments of why, why, why land reform. Uh, I always think that the idea of the land question by making it a singular sort of misses the point that there are competing versions of the land question. Um, I actually, in, in preparing for today, I, I, I was looking up what Oliver Tambo said about um, about land. And one very interesting intervention he made was actually directly about linking land with citizenship. And it's an, a very interesting story from 1982, when um, the apartheid government tried to offer basically the land of Kangwane, the, the Bantustan, to Swaziland, and was actually part of a bro broader strategy of trying to blur the line between Bantustan and neighboring states to create an exclusively white state. And, and he very directly, and there's a wonderful quote uh, from him, uh, where he basically says that, um, that basically this is about the dispossession of land being about the stripping of citizenship. And that he, he saw these as intimately connected. And, and I think that that is still uh, a core issue that uh, land dispossession and its uh, political as well as economic impacts is still a question of disenfranchisement. But I wonder then, surely that is why you would expect uh, a state, an ANC-led government, to have a firm view, which is that we are a unitary state, and to contest the ways in which we still have two kind of systems of, of, of law and practice, our approach to customary law, our approach to land tenure, our approach to the traditional courts bill keeps on trying to revert to the idea that there must be different legal frameworks for people based on where they live and their race. And all of this has gender implications. So, you know, that's the inspiration I take from his argument, which is that it is about citizenship. There's a national land question as well as a class one. And I think those two strands have, have run through the whole of the 20th century and are still unresolved. Is this a national issue? Is this a class issue? And how do we think through the two together? Thank you so much, Ruth. I think that's um, a wonderful um, a place to start, especially as you, you, you quote um, Oliver Tambo. I think, um, you know, this is the, the idea that we also brought into the, the, the policy debates and the discourse in our publication land in South Africa, um, contested meanings and nation formation, because I think it often gets lost in the maze when we talk about land as a commodity, land uh, for product productivity and so forth. So um, Tembeka, what is your take on, on, on this? I know um, that you've mentioned, um, I think, you know, in, in different fora and, and, and particularly in your um, first um, published book around the formation of the ANC itself was for the, the you know contest, land contestation was at the center of that. So, what is your what are, what how do you um, how do you see um, the, la the the role of land in in the national um, sphere? Yes, uh, yes, it's not fundamentally different to what Ruth uh, was saying, but I think. Firstly, I historicize the debate, and then secondly, I think of the contemporary meanings. On the historical front, um, what you've got to look at is that there were two statutes uh, that were passed within a period of three years in succession uh, to each other. The one was the 1909 South African Union Constitution, and that Union Constitution um, created citizenship for 
white English speakers, and they actually call them Europeans. Uh, and then also for white Dutch speakers, uh, the Dutch speakers subsequently uh, introduced Africans and the two languages were subsequently made to be equal. But those were the citizens, the, the natives were outside the basket of citizenship. The next act that was passed to give effect to this idea of the citizenship created in the 1910, uh, in the 1909 stroke 1910 South African Union Constitution was the 1913 Native Land Act. Uh, the opening section to that was that uh, natives are not allowed uh, to acquire land in areas that are designated for European occupation. So it's concretizing the idea of who is a citizen uh, versus who is a non-citizen. So this idea of citizen versus a, uh, a subject. In between that, in 1912, the ANC is formed. Its primary demand is citizenship. It's citizenship for native people who have been stripped of citizenship by the 1910 South African Union Constitution. Its immediate campaign is against the Native Land Act. It marches, it protests, it sends deputations, but its primary campaign for the beginning of the 20th century is about uh, the Native Land Act. In 1955, it also concretizes its vision and the opening clause of the Freedom Charter is that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. That's the vision that is carried through in the constitution, in the preamble, which also says that we believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And it includes, it no longer says both black and white, but it includes united in our diversity. But the point about South Africa belonging to all is that if the majority is landless by law, South Africa does not in fact belong to all. And the proclamation in the Freedom Charter also converted into the constitution is an affirmation that South Africa's land should be distributed to all who live in it. So it's, it's primarily that historical demand that we are trying to, to meet. There are, as Ruth points out, also contemporary question of food security. And we see in the 2017 December National Conference Resolution of the ANC, that it now adds the element no longer just addressing problems of past dispossession, but also ensuring that there is food security, which is threatened by landlessness. Thank you very much um, for that um, very useful his historical um, exposition um, that I think helps us to trace uh, the why are we here and, and what puts us here? So not because, you, you know, what is your view? I mean, as a, an academic in the urban spatial environment, um, I think on last count, um, the figure was about 31 million um, South Africans vest, well dwell in semi and um, semi-urban spaces with absolutely no legal property or, 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 or legally recognizable um, land rights. What does that, um, where, does, where, where does that put the need and the hunger for urban um, land, which is, I suppose, really a need for um, proximity to economic opportunities? What, in your view, um, places that context uh, within the whole idea of who is excluded and who's included within um, the framework of land reform? I mean, the, the kind of the, when we look at the, um, the land question in relation to urban spaces, it gets a little bit trickier because we have policies that have kind of relegated the question around um, land reform and land, redu land, redistrib land redistribution in particular in urban areas. Um, and they've kind of whittled it down to just a housing problem. So kind of the need is assessed as kind of a need for housing. 
and then um, policies and, and different programs and subsidies have been developed to kind of cater for that need. But unfortunately, what happens with any kind of pro program, um, it only can cater for so many people. And so it only caters really for a, a very small uh, fragment of that 31 million. Um, and there are millions more who are not captured in that number actually, um, who are also in need, but, um, but somehow, some way will just fall just outside of kind of the way that we've defined the, the, the way that we've defined need and the way that we've defined and determined who is in need. So kind of they, they don't, they quite just quite don't quite meet kind of um, the criteria that we've established to determine who's actually in need. And also, I mean, I think with the way that we also understand need um, isn't nuanced enough. So yes, it is a problem around access to shelter, but it's also an issue around um, access to opportunities, not just economic, but also social as well. So access to education, um, also being close to your social networks uh, um, for those in urban areas, but also trying to also keep ties as well. What we often forget is also that it's also a need about, there's also a spiritual and a cultural element to it that ties in quite closely with the, the notion of citizenship. Um, that you've also highlighted before. So it's about looking at individuals and households holistically um, and in order to, for them to access, um, we can say housing, but we can say more broadly land in order to live um, holistic and fulfilled lives, be it in an urban space or be it um, in, a, in kind of the, on the, um, in a more rural setting. Thank you very much. Um, and I think that that lends us uh, quite neatly into um, my next, the next issue that I think we should be um, thinking about. We know that the, the constitution does not make provision for the right to property, neither does it prescribe the kind of tenure system um, either currently or for the future. And what I mean by that is Quite peculiarly, Section 25.1, which is uh, obviously contained in the Bill of Rights, is interestingly the only section that starts off um, in the negative, which is, you know, no one may be deprived of property, um, as opposed to other rights in the Bill of Rights that are stated in the positive, the right to life, the right to dignity. And obviously, mm -hmm. we know that this is as a result of a very delicate balance and attention um, that existed in those Kempton Park negotiations. Um, with the National Party on one side, uh, protecting existing property rights of the time into the future, and the ANC that was gunning for um, the land reform provisions later on in Section 25. So my question really is, how possible is it to achieve land reform without tinkering with um, existing property markets, um, number one, I think that's the first one. And the second issue is we've all um, seen and experienced that the state in attempting to find resolutions for the question, um, uh, for example, on, 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 on redistribution, they've chopped and changed various policies, you know, recap and, and all of those policies. And um, the question really is why was it or why is it that the state has tended to focus on uh, farmland and rural land as a lever towards land reform without actually uh, looking into the broader question of the property markets and um, I suppose land in all its facets. I think we have an order of answering. <laughs> Any, anyone, <laughs> anyone can take this start. I want to deal with the first part of the question, um, which is the issue of the property market. I mean, I, I think that it is impossible to ask the market to resolve uh, land dispossession. Um, we have had an unbridled market-oriented approach in this country since uh, 1997. It has failed. Um, we've had a state that has been extremely reluctant to 
take policies that interfere with the operations of the market. And the, those distortions have not only failed, but they have worked in ways that continue the dispossession of African people. So how do we see this? We see it in two specific ways. The, the one is the ways in which we think about uh, compensation. Our compensation system is an entirely market-driven compensation system. And it, that is the case even after 2018, when the ANC said it was now you know, taking a so-called radical approach to land reform. The bottom line is that state policy still privileges a market form of compensation. There is no doubt on the available evidence that the market-based compensation system has failed. So we can't allow the market to drive the compensation formula of the country. It has to be tempered with by deliberate state action. We also see the, the ways the market functions in what has been referred to by some academics, which is a term I've recently adopted. We also see it in, in specifically in uh, the dominance of the market uh, in relation to how the land is made available. And the academics have called this a land owner veto. And there is too much control of land owners in which land becomes available for sale. And we know that land is primarily made available through private sale or auctions. And it's landowners who decide which land will be made available. But they also decide the price. When they make that land available, they set the price. They also decide the use. And Stellenbosch University recently produced a study which showed that of all of the farms made available, for the redistribution programs, 99% of them have been grazing land. I mean, that is an astonishing figure. 99% has been grazing land, which shows that food producing farms are not being put on the market for redistribution purposes. It's only grazing land that is being made available for redistribution purposes. And then fourthly, they also decide who buys the land because it's often people who have relationships with them, or at least can design or strike relationships with them. Those, four, those two areas in which the market has been at the center of land reform have both failed. So what we need is intentional state action to temper with the unbridled market orientation of land reform in South Africa. The current system is unsustainable. And it has not failed because the market is not being allowed to dictate it. It has failed despite the market orientation, despite the faithfulness of the country to market-based solutions. I'd love to jump in, Bulalwe, if I'm allowed. Uh, and that is to say, um, I, I totally agree. Uh, and I think that the old classical debates about land reform around the world have been the role of the state versus the market. Um, and it's very clear that despite the provisions for the state to take specific action to bring about equitable access to land, to redress uh, dispossession and to secure tenure, the state has chosen not to, to and so has adopted this approach of buying out privilege through the market, which is clearly not, not, not yielded results. But I think that the, there's a problem even beyond that problem, which is that the state itself behaves when it does intervene in favor of the market. It's not only that the state is beholden to the market, it actually behaves in ways that uh, aggravate that bias towards the market. And some specific example that I would give is for instance, you know, when the state as a substantial owner of, of public land uh, makes decisions about how it uses its land, it is not to decommodify public land and to make it available, but very often to privatize it, to sell off public land to the highest bidder, to developers, um, to lease out municipal common edge land. Um, and, and even when the state is purchasing on the market uh, land from private owners to hold a state land to make available through redistribution on a leasehold basis, it behaves like a landlord, like any other landlord. It wants its rent and it evicts you. Uh, you know, and, and so I think that our thinking about 
the role of the state and the role of the market needs to be go beyond uh, the market always leads to elite capture, the state is the antithesis. And that's the debate we have to have around expropriation. If you look at the Government Immovable Assets Management Act, Guillaume, which governs how the state is to, um, to deal with its own uh, public property, uh, the idea that the state must realize the highest value from that property has been interpreted to sell it off to the highest bidder. You know, this should not be interpreted as a financial uh, highest value. It should be the public interest. So, you know, that's I, I think that the um, the problem that we have when we equate redistribution with commodification, whether redistribution is about transferring private title or about the state becoming the landlord, what we haven't grappled with is the the concept that redistribution can or should at least in part be about decommodifying land um, and not simply uh, transferring private assets, but, but rethinking property. Um, and there, you know, I think that the lessons globally are from land reforms is that within capitalist economies, there will be reconcentration. Uh, and I think that the, the particular history of colonialism and apartheid in South Africa that, that means raises at the center sometimes means that we are talking about dispossession as if it's a, a relic of the past rather than something that is rapidly underway right now uh, through the operation of the market and through the operation of the state. Uh, and this came home to me some time ago when we were looking at farm worker evictions, which in the first decade of democracy even in the first decade of and a half of democracy, the more black people were stripped of their minimal access to land than the total number who got access to land through reform. You know, so, so in terms of dispossession, we're going backwards. We can do more of the same of land reform. We can do it less corruptly. We can do it a bit faster. Uh, but the structure of our economy is continuing with the dispossession. And I think that that means that we need to think about the law, but we need to think about the, the role of decommodifying land and strengthening entitlements to land. Thank you, Ruth. And I think just to, you know, before I give Nobukwisi an opportunity, I think it's important for all of us to realize that the state occupies with uh, many different hats. The state is a spatial planner. The state is a landowner. The state is uh, also an evictor. And we've seen um, that where the state has chosen in the post-constitutional era, the state has chosen to build um, affordable housing or RTP houses right at the outskirts, very far from uh, social, um, economic, and cultural uh, nodes. And we have to begin to ask the questions. Um, and, and, and that puts the power of municipalities right in the center, because municipalities have the power, they have the agency um, to, to determine how we bridge that spatial um, gap, not, not, for, not just for the sake of it, um, but also because um, of the dispossession uh, historical sin that, that we need to, to, to continue to deal with. And of course, as you're saying, you know, you spoke about farmland evictions. Um, in practice, we see a lot of um, urban evictions and the state being right at the center um, of those evictions. So on one hand, the state purports itself as a potential tool to resolve the land reform problem on one hand. But on the other hand, we see in cases, um, you know, that, that we deal with the state being a perpetrator and in fact, a perpetuator of this dispossession. Now, of course, I'm sure you'll, you'll have a lot of insight to share with us um, on, on that. I mean, what, are your, what, are your, what are your views on, on, on the, the, the whole idea of property markets and the role of, of the state? I mean, absolutely, in many instances, um, the state is complicit in, um, in kind of the high rates of evictions that we're witnessing in the present day, um, as well as in how, in like enabling the market to operate in ways that continue, um, um, that, or in ways that allow um, for continued disposition of, of particularly uh, persons of color. Right. And I mean, um, we, so we can't we can't separate kind of the state and and kind of frame the state as this angel 
who is who is going to be able to resolve the challenges that we were currently facing when they are part and parcel um, of creating and, and some of those challenges, right? I mean, a, a key example would be kind of a lot of evictions that we see in the inner cities um, stemming from your kind of policies and, and spatial plans, spatial tools, spatial planning tools, such as your urban development zones that, that give um, property developers additional um, tax rebates if they kind of develop in, in specified areas and specific areas. And what often that happens is that they will, a developer will go into an area and they will obviously try and buy up as many properties as they can in that area. And often it's properties um, that are being leased out. Um, if I use the case of Woodstock in Cape Town, it's, uh, it, uh, um, it's property that has been kind of leased out and it's being leased out to our kind of working class residents, many of whom have been in the area for generations. Um, and then the properties are bought up, um, and in, in some rare instances, um, those uh, residents actually own the properties, but the properties are bought up at kind of at, at prices that don't enable households to buy property in the same area. Um, so they end up then also getting dis uh, kind of dis displaced because then they need to, even if they have like a million, they need to then move to the urban periphery to get a house of a similar size. Um, and also because, I mean, Cape Town's property rate is very, very skewed. Um, and that's a whole conversation on its own. Um, and that's something that absolutely needs to be addressed. It's unaffordable, um, even for kind of your, your, your middle class, young middle class professionals, it is unaffordable. So we really, on, on the whole and across the country, have an affordability crisis in the uh, as far as the property market is concerned, and whilst the kind of our focus is often on those who are currently homeless and landless, we need to understand that when we look at the property market as a whole, the fact that our property markets are, are kind of um, catering for the higher and the luxury end of the markets means that the few affordable properties that do come into the system are quickly snatched up by those who would normally consider middle class. And that continuously leaves those and working class households out in the fringes and in the cold. And so that is absolutely something that we have to address. And, I, and in my opinion, in my personal opinion, I don't think we can achieve land reform without tinkering with the property market. Um, something needs to be done, something has to give way, but perhaps it's also a question around looking at property ownership versus use. Right? So it's an issue around land ownership versus use. And often we conflate ownership with use and perhaps there's a conversation to be had around separating the two and, and then kind of reimagining the property system with, with that kind of foundation in mind and taking that forward. Yeah, I think that's a fundamental one. And I think it's a philosophical question, you know, um, the debate has been um, that, you know, the black population has been so largely disenfranchised and um, has borne the, um, the burden of, of, of land dispossession. So do we favor a system of tenure that says we all become landowners in a kind of a Western Westphalian um, Roman Dutch law um, framework and is that sustainable or do we um, think that we should be discussing or advocating for a system of use as you, as you, as you said Nobukosi. Um, some arguments we've heard in the you know in, in and we've seen in the media where the EFF has said um, that they, that they are favoring a kind of a custodianship um, argument when it comes to land. And of course, custodianship isn't new in South Africa. We have the minerals framework in the Mineral and um, uh, Resources Deve Development Act where minerals are licensed uh, to use it. So we do have a precedent um, of the rights of use in many, many uh, aspects in law, whether that's a right of way um, and so forth. And, I'm interested to find out what your views are in relation to land, um, considering issues of climate change and densification and all of, and all of those issues put in the pot to say, should we be advocating 
for titling, should be advocating for um, that all of us will ultimately become individual landowners? Um, or is there another way? Um, should we be looking at Jews? And as I said, there isn't, we don't have a constitutional system that says private ownership um, is a right, so to speak. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, let's hear what, uh, what all of you think about, about that, which is largely really a question of what is the future land tenure system of South Africa look like? Um, I mean, I can answer, well, maybe not answer, but debate the, the issue of uh, uh, um, the possibility of uh, state custodianship uh, for South Africa. So I think that many black people who are claiming lands under the restitution program will be extremely disappointed to learn that as soon as they finally have the right to own, uh, that land will now be taken over by the state, uh, particularly because that was the effect of 1913. It was to put land control and land ownership in the hands of the state, it was crown land. And much later, it was put under the South African Development Trust, but it couldn't be owned by black people. So for a long time, their own dream has been, one day I want to have a title. And the post-apartheid uh, land reform program has also tended to privilege uh, private title, you know, as the sort of holy grail of land reform. So I think that there will be a lot of resistance uh, from the beneficiaries of uh, the restitution program to a form of state custodianship. Now that of course depends on what exactly we mean by state custodianship, because part of the problem with the ALC's articulation of state custodianship has been its shifting uh, language from the first version to the current third version, which I now hear yesterday was withdrawn. But th there has been a shift in relation to what they mean. If state custodianship simply means giving the state greater administrative power over land allocation, you know, to make decisions around how the land should be used and to impose rules such as if you don't use the land, you should lose it. That version of custodianship is not uh, in conflict with what many people want who are the current beneficiaries. But if state custodianship means the ultimate abolition of private property, and we've got to be frank about it in order to have a meaningful discussion. If it means a total abolition of private property, that is an extremely serious thing. It cannot be introduced via the back door in a constitutional amendment which was intended to debate the compensation clause. It needs to be opened up so that South Africans can make a decision. My sense is that it will be rejected. I personally am not a big supporter of private property at all costs under all circumstances. But I think that many South Africans believe in private property. They see private property as the ultimate sign Hi, Tembeka, I think you're frozen. Um, can you maybe just take a look at your connectivity? I'd hate to miss the point you're making. Um, can you hear us, see us? Tembeka? Perhaps while he tries to reconnect, Ruth, um, can you maybe give us your insights? Um, well, I fully those... agree. Thank you. And, uh, and flowing directly on from Tim Becker, I mean, the one question is, does, would nationalization solve the problem? Uh, does transferring all private property into state ownership uh, through statute, through the law, resolve the problem? the problem being multiple problems, really a historical justice problem, uh, a question of unequal access. Um, 
And of course, underpinning all of that, also the, 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 the inability of the state to provide any kind of security uh, of tenure for, for the majority of citizens. So, you know, I think that um, we have already got the experience, as you say, of, um, of state custodianship in the sense of nationalizing natural resources uh, in the form of the NPRDA for minerals and the Water Act for water. And I think that, you know, one would be hard pressed having looked at the track record uh, of those two laws to say that nationalizing a natural, a, national, a natural resource translates into redistribution, let alone redress. If anything, the, the history of the connection between uh, the mining sector and dispossession is only accentuated if one looks at what's been happening in uh, the Northwest, in parts of the Eastern Cape, where mining is one of the main drivers of ongoing dispossession. So if, we, if we're interested in how, what we should learn from not just colonial and apartheid era dispossession, but post-apartheid post dispossession, we know that the state being the custodian of the resources <laughs> is partly what is driving this. I think that there's one reason though why the minerals and water uh, analogy doesn't quite um, work in terms of land, which is that there's never been, I mean, water rights have been largely held by, by farmers and big uh, industry. Um, historically, that's what was nationalized. Uh, mining, similarly, the actual use of mining rights has been with very few users, whereas with, with land and land-based property, including everything from a farm to a small holding, to a house, to a shop, to, a, you know, any uh, land base is, is a huge thing. So if the state were to nationalize, it would need to create simultaneously some system to allocate and manage all the land, all the privately owned land in South Africa. Now, one can have a debate about whether that's desirable, whether it's feasible. Um, I think that the key point here is politically, it's not on the cards, which is why um, the, the EFF and ANC fudging what the constitutional amendment is really for has unsurprisingly come to ground. <laughs> it, was, it was predictable that this would happen. Um, but I think that the, the key issue here is that the expropriation bill is like one leg of a three-legged pot. It's about the state power. In my view, state power has never been the problem. It's not the reason. It's a misdiagnosis to say that an inadequate level of state power has held back Ra radical and dramatic change in land relations. I think the, the problem has been political, but nonetheless, um, a, a strong expropriation bill and a clear mandate, which I think citizens have given to the state uh, in 2018, the public uh, hearings around the constitutional amendment, I think that was a powerful political mandate for the state to say, we want you to confront private property interests in our, in, to our benefit. But the expropriation bill doesn't do that. It confirms the state power. It doesn't confirm the rights of citizens. And so my, my view is that I always go back to section 25.5, which I think is like the Cinderella clause of the property clause, which is we have a right of equitable access. Now, how can the state be forced to, to realize that right of equitable access and, and whose interests should take priority? So I think that having a strong land reform or redistribution framework bill that says here is how you as a citizen can force the state not to hand out land as a matter of uh, what, what what civil servants when, once uh, referred to as political smarties. This isn't about handing out willy-nilly. This is about a justiciable socioeconomic right. The state has to be accountable for how it does that. Um, so, and the third leg of the pot would be to say when and how the state wants to compensate. Many of the people dispossessed in the public interest uh, or for public purposes in this country are poor. Um, and if, when is the state going to compensate and when not? So just affirming the state's power without its obligations and citizens' rights and without clarifying the question of when compensation and when not, I, I, I think is in a sense um, empty. And, and I think politically, there's only so far it can run before the state has to put some cards on the table. Thank you, Ruth. Um, welcome back, Tembeka. I think if you want to pick up on your points, um, please do, but I just also would like to remind our audience um, to please address questions on the q and I will read some of them to and open them to the panelists um, while Tembeka just, uh, you know, um, 
completes the point that he was making around private pro, private pro, uh, private property ownership rights um, and custodianship and so forth and what the the pulse of the nation, especially the dispossessed, would be on the question of ownership versus use. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that I'm a skeptic, uh, both, you know, as a matter of biology, but also just as a matter of intellectual orientation. I'm a skeptic of private property, especially in its unbridled forms. But I think that many South Africans actually believe in private property. Uh, what they see in private property is the ultimate sign of success. They want to own houses, um, they want to own apartments, they want to own cars, but they want them in their name. And in a society that's recovering uh, from years of laws that specifically told them that they couldn't be owners, uh, they will reject a notion that says, even your own uh, government prevents you from ownership. So that will be politically unpalatable. Now that, of course, is why the, the ANC has not been clear. It has been probably deliberately ambivalent about disposing or custodianship. And so for that, custodianship is unlikely to be a policy of the government. Uh, Rebecca, please can you look at your connection again? I think we're losing you again. We, the sound is um, disappearing on you. Um, and then now? Uh, no, I, I think you're on mute. No? Am I on mute? And am I still on mute? We still can't hear you, but I can see you're not on mute. So I'm not sure if it's the sound on your side that's letting you down. Um, they say that they can hear me on their side. No. Uh, everyone has to speak. Are you not on mute, uh, perhaps? Sorry, we still can't hear you. I can see your mouth moving. But I think um, what what uh, let, let me let me um, yeah I'll move I'll move to the question if you can type maybe you. Um, Mulanwa, you're muted. Okay. Um, let me. Is this better? I, I'm trying. I'll be quite clear. I'm not sure if you can hear me. All right. No, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, just one sentence. So I think for these reasons that I've articulated, which is many people adhere to this idea of private property, despite my own misgivings and skepticism about private property, I think it's unlikely that the ANC will push ahead with custodianship, which means the abolition of private property. What's more likely is that it will continue its ambivalence. And that's probably one of the reasons why the Section 25 Amendment is probably unlikely to pass because the ANC itself is not fully committed to an amendment. But the criticism is that they are also not fully committed to the restructuring of the land reform program because if they don't want an amendment, then they must fix the disarray in land reform. Which leads me to the next question. I'll pick. I'll pick up. Uh, pick it up again with uh, Nobukosi, which leads me straight into the question. Uh, and I think it's it's both a political and a legal one. South Africa recognizes the structure of traditional leadership in the constitution as the custodians of culture and, and tradition and so forth. And yet we know that colonialism was part and parcel of inflicting that system also as a way of dispossessing Africans. We see that we still have bills in place that are perpetuating this idea of a communal land uh, tenure system, particularly in the TBVC states, which we inherited from colonialism and apartheid. And um, on the other hand, this objective of Section 25.5, which is to make land um, equitably available um, as a form of redress. How do we sit with both, you know, it's kind of like we're sitting uh, in two worlds where on one hand, we 
perpetuating this idea that Africans that live in um, informal spaces or the former TBV states are beholden to um, the ideas and decisions of traditional leaders. And yet at the same time, we talk about making land available equitably to all. I mean, that existential crisis and that kind of schizophrenic nature of, of what it is that we're trying to do. No, because what are your thoughts on, on, on this dichotomy? And I, I will tell you my opinion. My opinion is that um, it's not necessarily all black or white. I think inherent in this whole thing must be the, the, the ability of people to choose, to opt for a continuum of rights and, 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 and rights that will be available, that will be registrable, legally recognizable, but that will suit their circumstances. What's your view on this? I mean, sure, it's a difficult question to answer because it's so complex, right? But I mean, the case of, of, of the communal land um, uh, areas that are still governed under communal land just, just complicates everything tenfold. Um, but also when we also think about it from a spatial planning perspective, even communal lands lie within municipalities, right? And so then there's the added layer of, of all those communal lands, theoretically, um, being, being the, and some planning being undertaken at a municipal level for, um, for, for those communal lands and uh, w w uh, with spatial development frameworks and integrated development frameworks being doled out um, for each area. So theoretically, there should be um, the spatial development frameworks and the IDPs, which are also then kind of informed by the broader policy context around land redistribution and, and restitution, um, as well as other development drives and concerns and considerations that are, are set out in policy at national level, that should also be informing what's happening on communal land. But what we're finding is that in reality, it is a dual system. Folks on communal land are being governed under one system, and unfortunately, what tends to happen is that then those who are living on communal land um, way too often end up also not uh, getting access to basic services and rights, simply because kind of at the municipal municipalities also don't know how to engage with communal um, um, communal powers and, com and communal authorities and custodians of land and those spaces. So there is that disjuncture between kind of the municipalities imperative and directives, but then also the kind of the, the communal areas on the other hand. And we haven't figured out yet as planners, but also as government, we haven't quite figured out how to, to get that, to link those two processes and get them to work for the better of, of, of the, greater, the greater population who reside in communal areas. But I think it also gets very tricky. It is a political issue, right? There is a political reason why those structures were maintained. Um, and I mean, we can all go back and maybe um, Tembega can also give us a little bit of insight into that uh, when negotiations were happening in the early 90s. But I mean, those structures have been, have been maintained for political reasons. And when you speak to folks on the ground, there is also a real desire and a real need to access certain rights and, 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 and to push so that, because um, people are aware that they have the rights, certain rights, but they also um, understand that within the structures that they live in, um, it's very difficult to access those rights because then they, then they are governed um, under a different set of rules and norms, even though they're within this broader democratic context, right? And that's why we saw there was a really big push. Um, I forget which, the, the name of the bill, I think the land, the, the traditional courts bill, which essentially kind of um, made traditional courts kind of on par with the magistrate's court. And, and there was a lot of resistance in fighting against that, if I'm not mistaken, there was a lot of resistance in fighting against that, because there are folks who realize that sometimes none of the traditional courts are not fair. Um, and we need to have that legal recourse from the magistrate's court. But is but also access. Um, but and if we made the traditional courts on par with the magistrates' court, it would mean that any legal recourse that we sought in the kind of the Western system, legal system, would then have to be kind of going straight to the high court. 
which is which, and there are many barriers to accessing high courts. In fact, there are many barriers to accessing legal representation to, to begin with. But I mean, trying to access the high court is like, where do where does one even begin, right? Um, and so and so, yeah. So we we also need to have a frank conversation um, about communal areas and and areas that are under traditional custodianship, traditional leadership because those areas are being left behind, but also on the role of, of traditional leaders, because a few unfortunately um, believe that the land is actually theirs. So it comes back to the kind of the discussion that we're having earlier around the role of the state. If the state is to be custodian of the land, are we not gonna see it play out as what's happening in, in traditional areas where some folks believe that they actually own the land and they're doing people a favor um, by giving people access to that land? For, yeah. for, for basic yeah. purposes. Look, with, with 30 minutes left, I'd like us to engage with the questions that are coming through um, from the audience. And um, the one comment um, is that Hong Kong has uh, only had leasehold uh, for mostly 75 years. My personal view is that the leasehold system is only as good as its capacity, state capacity, and um, state's ability to, um, to administer land. And so if we talk about leasehold, um, if it means that it gives us certainty around who owns what land, how broad is it, can those people be evicted or not, then, uh, then I wouldn't be opposed to it. But I think the devil is in the detail around um, the issues that we know that have, you know, have, have uh, dominated uh, states in capacity, corruption, um, and so forth. So um, I also just want to, the questions are coming up fast and furious. So I'm going to give this one to Ruth uh, from Siabonga Pita. He says, what are the policy interventions that are needed to be implemented by government to fast track land redistribution? Um, I think Ruth, if you can take that one. And if I can take another one, um, which is from Kumo Faku, um, Tembeka, if you can deal with this one, which says, how can we deal with um, or redress the issue of colonial use of terra nullius to dispossess, mm -hmm. impoverish and create native human capital and the labor markets? Um, I'm just gonna really summarize the question. It's quite a long one. Um, how can we transform normative colonial, colonial power um, is, is, is really the essence of his question. And, and then, um, and then I'll, I'll take those two questions and then I'll find more engagement on the Q&A and also the chat group. I see people are writing on both. Um, I'll navigate both, no worries. Thanks, um, Bulalwa. I'm gonna jump right in. So. Siabonga is asking what needs to be done to fast track. Um, I think that there are a whole lot of things that the state can and should be doing right now, even in a context where there is no budget, effectively. Land reform has ground entirely to a halt. Most provinces bought not a single farm last year. Uh, the land, the, the public land that's being dished out is mostly uh, former white farms that were expropriated for incorporation into the Bantustans in the 70s. That's why most of it is around uh, the Northwest. So the state is now using systems of patronage to displace some black people and provide access to land for others. So I think that, I think that fast tracking simply uh, the amount of land redistributed is, is part of it. Um, I think that making public land public is really crucial. Cancelling and investigating all the, the leasing out and privatization of public land. I think engaging seriously with people around what their land needs are, as varied as they are. I think the first thing is to explode the idea that rural land is only for housing and urban land is only for, uh, rural land is only for farming and commercial farming and urban land is, is for housing. Whereas actually, you know, we're in the crosshairs in South Africa of de-agrarianization. Most rural people are not surviving entirely from farming their livelihoods. There's a lot of need for supporting diverse economies in rural areas. Uh, and a lot of that's what people want. Um, and, and the cities, uh, people need livelihoods. There are no jobs, they are not coming. Um, and, and so I think that thinking in much broader ways about an entitlement to land that's not just um, 
an abstract idea, but actually has mechanisms. If you are a person who needs land for a, a basic livelihood purposes, what is that right? And the right is to force the government, particularly local government, to listen to you. But I think importantly also, a decriminalization of land occupation. I think that we need to think about, about what a right as a citizen, if I as a citizen have a right of equitable access to land, then when exercising that right in a context where I cannot realize that right through the market, the state cannot criminalize me. I think that we need to think about these issues. I think that uh, the allocation has to be made transparent. We have totally, totally opaque systems of allocating land. If we had a housing program where the state were dishing out uh, either RTP houses or mansions here and there, we would be asking how it was rationing that. And on what basis? Some people get a lot and some people get little and some people get nothing. There would be a demand for transparency. We need the same in land reform. Otherwise, the, the entire system is set up for corruption. So you can expropriate as much as you like. But if we don't get the distribution right, uh, then we're going to hit the same problems. Very quickly, Hlonga, and I notice you saying, oh, but traditional leaders own land. Uh, well, you know, the Kasak uh, case uh, on the Ngonyama Trust, which... Uh, Kanya raised in the chat says, well, no, actually you don't. And, um, and so that form of custodianship is, is actually a, a right to governance. It is not uh, a, a property right. And I think that, you know, this is not isolated. There've been numerous court challenges where um, the state or other agencies uh, engage with traditional authorities to transact to transact customary land. Uh, and again and again, the message is you are not the owner. And here, I think that uh, when you say, Bulal, where people should be able to choose their tenure, well, many people who claimed restitution established communal property associations, but there's been outrage from traditional leaders who say you cannot set up communities who we see as being under our jurisdiction and give them private title under CPAs, then they fall outside our powers. And that's why Minister Nkwinti, former minister, said we won't set up CPAs in communal areas. Um, but I think that fundamentally, this goes back to that question of citizenship uh, and whether people have a right to choose their form of governance and related to that, their form of tenure. Um, thank you, yeah, Ruth. Thank you. Back up. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I mean, I want to link to what Ruth was saying. I mean, I think uh, this idea that chiefs own land is a distortion of customary law. Uh, chiefs have never owned land under customary law. At best, they have been trustees. Um, but the land has always belonged to the people. And the function of traditional authorities has always been administrative. The distortion happened in 1875 when a law was passed in Natal, um, called the Native Administration Act. That law was then extended to the whole country in 1927, again called the Native Administration Act, which linked traditional authority to land administration. But it was an utter distortion. Now, the reason why the colonists did it and the union government did it was because they were designing a system of native control there were just too many native people and they didn't know how to control them. And the way to control them was to entrust land control over the chiefs and to control the chiefs. And if you control the chiefs who control the land, you can control this uh, mass of natives. That gave a lot of power to the chiefs, which they over time began to believe was part and parcel of custom. So part of the constitutional function is precisely to focus on the distortion. It is to undo the colonial distortions and to come back to the true nature of customary law that the land in fact belongs to the people. Fortunately, as Ruth points out, the case of judgment given in June this year makes two points. Communal land before allocation belongs to the community. It does not belong to the chiefs. Once a stand has been allocated to a family, to the Mtunus or to the Buteleses, it belongs to that family. 
And you cannot give a stand today and then take it tomorrow. It belongs to that family in perpetuity. Now that's true customary law, not the distorted version that allocates land to the chiefs. So that needs to be repeated over and over again, that this idea is a colonial idea, which has now been embedded into our own post-democratic consciousness. The second thing I want to say is, in addition to what Ruth says about what we need, on the redistribution front, a constitutional amendment, which, as it turns out now, will not come to fruition. But if we had spent that time debating a land redistribution bill to give effect to Section 25.5 of the Constitution, that time would have been better spent. We don't have national legislation on redistribution. We're working on policy. We're working on administrative act. We're working on trial and error. It's a scandal that we have not got a national legislation to give effect to Section 25.5. And yet, as Ruth points out, Section 25.5 is the future of the South African-led program because the restitution program was always intended to be a temporary program until you have fixed all the claims of the people that can show that they were dispossessed after the 19th of June, 1913. But for the future, we always looked at redistribution, but no energy, no policy, no thinking, no money is going to redistribution. So that is a truly scandalous part of our land reform program. And then the last thing is to talk about this colonial framework. And I agree entirely, part of the outcome of this colonial mentality is the adherence to discredited notions of custom that marginalize women and concentrate power over chiefs. So we have to always think about an anti-colonial, I know a lot of people like decolonial, but we always have to think about an anti-colonial lens to land reform, because it is that anti-colonial lens that shows that land reform is a much bigger program that is about the return to the source. Of course, we cannot resolve the problem of 1913. There were only 9 million people of us then. We've got to resolve the problem of 2021, where there are 58 million people now. So we have to think about how to accommodate all of these people within a finite, land is a finite resource, within a finite resource that is gradually also shrinking. It's not as if this land uh, will be here forever. It's shrinking because the population is growing. So we have to think very carefully about how we allocate it, how we use it, and how we preserve it for future generations. Mm. Thank you, Tembeka. Um, there's a very, very interesting comment by Sta. Hi, Sta. And Sta says, can the panelists please share the views on compensation for material losses? So labor tenants who lose livestock, furniture, houses. Um, it seems that the, 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 the way the constitution and compensation debate is currently framed imagines only particular losses, mainly land itself. Um, and a particular group, i.e. white farmers, to the exclusion and marginalization um, of others. So let me give you my sense, um, Ta. And maybe this is also counterintuitive, uh, being a lawyer. But I believe that even our legal texts, prescripts, have not escaped colonialism. And this remains the case even post the constitution. And the reason I say that is, for example, if you look at the compensation framework um, in the mining legislation, the MPRDA, um, it imagines that compensating, for example, for um, uh, uh, um, losing land, it, 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 it's, its lens is a loss of land in its finite form. It doesn't consider that um, you know, there's relocation there are generations um, of occupiers, there's ancestral attachment to the land, there is emotional um, and uh, you know, um, issues of psychological displacement. So the, the, the perception of a compensation being market related um, finds itself consistently, even in those legal texts and even in the legislation, 
um, that we see today. Hence, the grave discontent um, that we've seen even on communities that have had to be relocated um, for corporations or for development is that even once you've, and even if in the context of a restitution with land claims, communities that have been given the financial compensation using the models and the policies um, get paid, but the discontent remains and pervades. And that's because of this idea that land is only a piece of ground and that can be measured and valued uh, using these market principles. And we know that the discontent is much broader than that. So, um, no, because I'd like your view on that, uh, on, on addressing um, Zita's issue. And, and I think I, I've given my opinion on that. And, and really that is that um, even the basis of our laws has not escaped its colonial influence. And the mere effect of having a constitution that, that is superimposed over it does not necessarily mean that that is going to be the magic pill that deals with all you know, the, the colonial underbelly, if you like, uh, of, of where we find ourselves. So I'd like your view, Nobukosi. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, I agree. But also the, what, we've, what often happens within the, the constitution and policy, we've kind of whittled down the issues and made them very technical, even though they're political, even though they're social and they're historically grounded, we've made them very technical. So around the issue of, of compensation, it's okay, you're losing land. We can, we can measure your piece of land and then we can, the market can work out the value for that. Technical solution, technical, I mean, technical problem, technical solution, it's done, it's sorted. We can move on, well, we can technically, theoretically move on with life, right? When we start now thinking about kind of loss of livestock, relocation, it gets messy because there's so many factors to consider, right? So we also have to then consider the, the emotional side, the spiritual side, and we, we move out of that very neat little technical box that we're in. Um, and it becomes very, even harder to quantify because then how do we quantify um, someone's, the loss of connection to your ancestral land and your ancestral grounds? Um, or we could maybe like your, there's a, been a family cemetery that's been there for a few hundred years. How do we quantify that loss, right? We can potentially quantify um, what, it would, what it would cost to exhume um, the deceased loved ones, but we can't quantify the, the kind of the, the, we can't quantify in monetary terms kind of that, what that disruption causes um, to you spiritually, right? So, I mean, we, so in, the, in short, um, Yes, it, we've got this very colonial layer on the constitution. And, and I mean, a lot of things kind of, kind of pulled through in various guises from the, from the colonial era, even in the constitution, and we've maintained we, that help maintain the system. Um, and even in, also in the way that the property market works and the markets generally work, have, have, there's, there's that continuance. Right, and I think it also then goes back to that question of how do we then just disrupt that? Do we need to find a mechanism of kind of just putting a stop to it, and then kind of starting anew with it, with something fresh and exciting um, that will then help us actually address all the issues that we're, we're facing? Or maybe it really is an issue of that perhaps we need to be using this anti-colonial lens that Temega speaks about or uh, perhaps it's another lens that we need to be using to, to view the issues um, so that we can not only understand them differently, but then identify alternative solutions that can help us begin moving things forward. Because the population is growing, land, there's only so much land as Timiga pointed out. And if we kind of keep twiddling our thumbs, this, the problem only gets worse. Thank you so much. And that le leads me to the next, Following question, I think it's a key question. Um, within the restitution program, we know that about 99% um, of claimants have opted for financial compensation. And how do we marry that? And, and of course, there's a particular context to that. There's joblessness, there's unemployment. Um, there is a collapsing you know, public education system and all of that. And how do we marry the fact that even with um, a program like restitution where people have opted for financial compensation, um, 
how do we marry that with 25.5 of the constitution that says we're doing all of this and we're all here today because we want the land. When people have, uh, or rather evidence and, uh, you know, and, and research has shown us um, that, that um, you know, that financial compensation has actually been favored. And I'd like to kind of remark on my question uh, firstly to say another very glaring um, gap in our legislative framework is the absence of post-settlement support. And I suspect that once you have a program that is designed for the giving of land to work, um, whether it's for productivity purposes or whatever purposes, then maybe that maybe we wouldn't see such um, you know an appetite for financial compensation as opposed to land. What what's your view on that? Because ultimately we're saying land reform because we want land. Um, in the context of a country like ours, what does it mean, Ruth? Well, listen, let's think about transitional justice because uh, restitution is a form of redress. It's a form of transitional justice. Globally, countries that have had land claims processes uh, that have actually worked to some degree in a relatively reasonable space of time have had two features. Firstly, it's been a minority of people who've been uh, dispossessed. And secondly, the period of from dispossession to repossession has been relatively short. I'm thinking like Kosovo would be like the poster child of, uh, of land restitution. So I think that, you know, in that sense, South Africa is not a, you know, a great candidate for saying we are going to resolve our, our, um, our land issues through investigating one by one, as if there was one moment where, you know, everything was just right, you know. Uh, and, and as Toko Didiza said, when people were talking about, uh, you know, changing the constitution to go back before 1913, she's like, ah, we talk about the 19th century, there's the Mfekane, like, uh, we're going to have ethnic issues. But I think that, um, you know, the point I would make about uh, transitional justice is that we have loaded land reform with the expectation that it's going to resolve all of the suffering and inequality that was produced through a complex set of historical processes. And so we had two commissions, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, primarily focused on gross human rights violations, and then a Land Claims Commission, which was expected to wrap up within five years. Uh, you know, and, and I think that what the difficulty there is that, you know, we haven't really dealt with the gross human rights violations, but all of the other forms of injustice that have also flowed from dispossession, you know, is what about reparation for influx control or Bantu education or, you know, all of other things. Um, and, and of course, both privilege has moved off the farms uh, into the stock exchange and into education and into urban property. Uh, and, um, and poverty and dispossession uh, is not purely equated with the demand for that particular land. So I think that one of the problems here is, of course, people want land back. Um, the restitution pro program puts an enormous onus onto proving dispossession. And our presidential panel, Bulalwe, you remember, said, you know, actually, the state should be expediting and saying, you know, we don't need to go through the full extent of historical investigation, deal with people's demand for land through, rest through redistribution, including pre-1913. Uh, we're in a, we, we must be honest and say, uh, you know, when we get to the point where the state is spending so much money on investigating claims uh, in order to settle small amounts of cash, you know, what are we doing here? Um, I think that there's a need to totally rethink, and I agree with you, Tim Baker. I think that, you know, the focus on restitution is largely because redistribution hasn't materialized. So, of course, people want to put in claims because there's nothing else going on. Your view, Tembeka? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the Constitution doesn't say that if you if you receive cash under the restitution program, you are not entitled to redistribution under Section 25.5, which is why, you know, people get money. They get, I think, the last amounts that I checked when I was writing Land Matters was that they were getting 30,000 rands, which was the equivalent of a housing subsidy. 
So they take the housing subsidy, they pocket it, they buy themselves nice things. Then after they go and stand on the queue for redistribution and they are waiting for RTP houses, which shows actually the policy uh, limits to restitution. You are never going to resolve the problems of South Africa through restitution. I mean, when I looked at the numbers um, of the people that could qualify, because restitution was meant for forced removals. So if you look at how many people actually qualify as a group that was forcibly removed, it was 5.5 million people. That's a fraction of how many people need land. So even if you resolved all of those claims you gave everyone who was a victim of forced removal between 1913 and 1991, when the Native Land Act was scrapped, you are going to deal ultimately with 5.5 million people. And so if you resolve that, what do you do next? So the future again remains redistribution. That's where the energy ought to be. We've got to pass the bill. We've got to pass a policy. We've got to scrap what is currently happening, which is which ultimately leads to uh, forms. I think Ruth uh, published a paper with uh, Tamela Cap, in which they coined the phrase "elite capture," and so so we've got to scrap the current policy, which encourages uh, elite capture, and we've got to replace it with an overarching legislative scheme in which we are looking at. How do we regulate the future for land reform in South Africa? And there we have to look at who needs the land most. And we have to insist that if people are not using the land, they must lose it. And we shouldn't be shy to say this because we are dealing with a finite resource. And these people are just hoarding the land and they're not using it. They should give it to the next person who should use it. Now, if we are going to implement that policy, we have to say, this is the scheme that exists for empowerment, you know, giving people the skill and the ability, not necessarily to work the land. Many black people know how to make the land. It's the commercial side that actually has eluded them for historical reasons. So it's getting them access to the markets and it's getting them the ability to know concepts uh, like exports, to know concepts like uh, market penetration and concentration, which is where basically white farmers beat black people. It's getting those concepts around how they get access to the markets if they need the land for purposes of commercial activity. And then we have to look at those people who need the land for residential purposes. Uh, Ruth made the point that uh, there is a de-agrarian de -agrarian, uh, shift that's happening. The Land Bank published a report, I think, in 2017, in which it said 62%, there had been a 62% urban migration in South Africa since 1994, 62%. So people have been abandoning the villages, they've been abandoning the countryside, they've been going to the cities. They need land in the cities, but we call this housing. Why? Because we have a, an artificial separation between the land affairs department and the housing department. And it's time to close that gap to recognize that housing is land as well. Thank you, Tembega. And I think that leads, um, le that leads me to some of the recommendations um, that uh, the panel, the presidential advisory panel that, that Ruth and I set on May, and that was to have a clear policy on who must benefit from land reform, who must be prioritized. And we've then seen a publication of a policy by government um, called the Beneficiary and Selection Policy. And I'm being facetious here, but we found, uh, you know, um, military veterans found themselves there as um, a group of people that, that ought to be prioritized. And uh, I just found it very peculiar. And I'm being facetious because I'm thinking of the elite capture point that you made earlier. Um, and, and for me, this is exactly where we should be speaking about women, speaking about youth. Um, especially in the, in the context of um, such, you know, youth unemployment. Part of um, 
what I've written in the Land in South Africa book as well is around the fact that we haven't used section 25 and section 26 as sections that are mutually, um, that are tied together. You know, we have human settlements um, having policies around where they're going to put informal settlements and thinking that that is solving a housing problem without necessarily, you know, that being linked with a land reform um, perspective. And then on the issue of the agrarian reform, again, I think, and this is a point that Prezi Mabasa makes in the, in the same book where he says, we've been so obsessed with mega com commerce that um, we haven't actually paid attention to the women who are farming. Um, yes, not in the mega uh, macro, you know, huge commercial economic sense, but who just need to be provided with access to markets who are you know, conducting urban vertical farming in cities and um, who are traders in, 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 and so forth. So I think that, that, that opens up a question around um, the idea that you know, how to disrupt the market doesn't mean chaos and disorder, but it can be done in such a way that you actually enable um, those that are already in it by ensuring that, they, you know, that, that there is um, access to markets. I see you nodding, no, because you do want to weigh in on this one. Yeah, I mean, it, it actually, it doesn't have to, I mean, we often equate disruption with chaos and disorder, but it, it absolutely doesn't have to. In minute ways that we're not yet able to kind of envision I'm um, so sorry, no, because we have to wrap up. I've just seen um, <laughs> that no I have to hand over um, to, <laughs> to um, Gyaki Petros from APSA. Please, can we do that? Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Program Director. Time is um, the real enemy here tonight. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of a very fascinating conversation about a topic that is so closely linked to identity, citizenship, legitimacy, and indeed our psyche as a nation. Land reform is without a doubt one of the most challenging policy issues facing a political economy still in the process of transforming. Um, Namibia and Zimbabwe are two Southern African country cases in point. South Africa also brings a heavy history of segregation, racial zoning, and fragmentation, as we have heard earlier. Colonialism and apartheid have left South Africa with highly unbalanced spatial inequality traps, where disadvantaged communities live in poverty and underdevelopment, where cities run inefficiently, and where poor rural populations live without the security of jobs or property ownership. And yet, Apartheid style spatial planning still carries on with low income housing being established at the very edges of economic hubs and thus perpetuating spatial and regulatory imbalances. As pointed out in this webinar tonight, land reform is a multifaceted topic which is central to nation building, sustainable growth and development, as well as transformation. As a country, we have clearly not been able to do this correctly. And there's a lot that we still have to think about and process. With these uh, closing remarks, um, allow me to thank our panelists who have so gener generously shared their knowledge on this topic. Uh, Professor Ruth Hall, Advocate Tembeka Ngaitobi, Ms. Nobukosi Ngwenya. I also wish to thank the audience Thank you for your active participation. We hope that you found the discussion valuable and insightful. I would also like to thank our facilitator, Ms. Bulelo Mabasa, for your excellence in facilitating such an important dialogue. Allow me to also thank Natasha Eli and Ite Mutzelibane from the Tambo Foundation for their hard work and dedication to making today a success. Last but not least, I'm grateful to my colleague, Viewer Laliane, for all her hard work that went into preparing for this event. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bunova.
Chembeke Nobukosi. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. I actually picked up your last comment. I think that's exactly it. The youth point, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Well, thank you. I like your cheering. Um, <laughs> cheer is always a good thing. Thanks. I'm so sorry, Nobukosi. I didn't finish your no last worries. point. I really no. didn't see the, the time. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a problem at all. Not a problem at yeah. all. We'll chat um, again soon. I was going to say, well, there's more conversations to be had. The problem, you, Until the problem you. is solved, we must keep talking about it and exactly. finding solutions. Thank you, Yankee. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah. Nice to see Thank you. you all so much. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.